How are y'all doing? Good. <laughs> uh, my name is Ryan, uh, one of the pastors here, and we are in week three of a five-week series called Building a Great Family. The basic pitch is to say, five weeks, give us five weeks, and we'll get you on your way to making your family life what you always dreamed. Because family's complex, our families take many different shapes, and what wisdom does God's word have to share for us uh, where we may find ourselves For the most part, in this series, we're drilling down into two things, parenting and marriage. If you can get parenting and marriage right, you are well on your way to having a great family. However, today, we're going to throw you a curveball, and we're going to look at these two things from a different direction. Instead of parenting and marriage, we're going to talk about how do you be a kid? And we're going to talk about how do you be single if you're not married? We've got some kids up front. You guys came on the right day. Lucky. (laughs) That's going to be our title today. How to be a kid and how to be single. Where are the kids in the house? I know there's a couple right up here. Where's the kids in the house? What, the rest of you aren't children? You don't have parents? You see what I'm getting at? We don't all have kids, but we are all kids of somebody. We are all the child of somebody. And as part of the larger goal of being part of a great family, it's just as important that we learn how to be a kid as we learn how to parent. Okay, so we're going to talk about that this morning. Um, Secondly, where's my single people out there? Got any single people? Okay. I'm trying to simplify your lives and help you identify each other, you know? (laughs) It's like, oh, she's available, he's available. Where's my single people out there? Okay, well, whatever. Uh, According to the Pew Research Center, uh, as of last year, last summer, 2022, Uh, Some 30% of adults in the United States are single, and they define single in a broad way to include anybody who's not married, not living with somebody, and not in a committed relationship. So if we narrow the definition a little bit and say, well, who's married and who's not married, about 50% of American adults are single. So there's a very good chance that you or someone you know and love is asking the question, well... I'm single and a Christian. How do I fit into the whole family thing? So we're going to talk about that this morning too. But I want to first, by way of introduction, I want to back up and try to see the bigger picture of the culture we live in. What are we facing? What's the situation? Our teaching team, we're very aware. We talk a lot about the fact that family, the definition of that is very much up for grabs today, isn't it? It's, it's, it's not a shocking news. The 1950s are long gone with the norms of a nuclear family, mom and dad every night sitting at the dinner table, big Bible on the table, three little youngins around. Like we're actually closer to the 2050s in time than we are to the 1950s right now. How did we get to where we find ourselves today? Where divorce is more common than not, where growing up in split or blended families is more common than not, and where procreation has been separated from the concept of a family. How did we get here? Um, there's actually a complex story of how we got here, and it goes way past the 1950s. It starts way earlier, and maybe the 1950s weren't all they were cracked up to be anyways. What we are witnessing with the breakdown of the family is actually just a very small part of a much broader cultural transition that has been unfolding in the Western world for many centuries. And we we can describe it, we can summarize it like this. Go ahead and throw up the first slide if you would, guys that there's been a major cultural shift in modernity, and we'll just define that as like the year 1500 onward, from norms of authority to norms of authenticity. Major shift from norms of authority to norms of authenticity. What does that mean exactly? Well, it is about fundamental questions of what matters and who says. Who says? And what matters? For much of history, it was assumed there are certain authority figures who are to be trusted and who are to be obeyed. There's God, there's the king, there's the priest, there's the judge, there's the father. There is a hierarchical shape to reality, and that's just the way the world is. The big idea of modernity has been to challenge all that. Slowly but surely, in different areas of society over the centuries, the center of gravity has moved. What matters is no longer what some figurehead out there in the hierarchy says. What matters is what my, my thinking says and what my heart says. So it's a shift. This is the big idea. It's a shift from authority out there somewhere to authenticity in here somewhere. Does that make sense? 
the hero is no longer the soldier going off to die dutifully for God and country. No, the hero is the, the anti-hero who follows his or her own heart to the end, regardless of what God or country or anybody else might say. That shift is key. And let's think about how then it applies specifically to the issue of family. It's bigger than that, but how does it apply to families? Let's put it like this. Go ahead and throw up the second one if you guys would. Is that the modern challenge to all forms of authority destabilizes the family, marriage, parenting, intergenerational loyalty, traditions. All of these things are kind of destabilized, which in turn destabilizes society. It's all linked up in that way. Let's, let's talk about what that means. So think about how this might pray, play out in practical situations. You want a divorce, maybe. Well, why not? The church can't stop you. The state can't stop you. There's nobody to prevent you from doing what you want to do. Uh, you can uh, split the nucleus of your family. It doesn't matter the fallout, and society is going to pick up the pieces. Now, some of you in this room probably have gone through a divorce, and I want you to know you're not at all a second-class citizen here. Maybe you didn't want to get a divorce. You know, maybe it was forced upon you. Your spouse was unfaithful. Where one will not, two cannot, right? If one person's just not having it, a marriage is not going to work. But let's look at the larger societal stake of that because the basic building block of society is the family, not the individual. The basic unit is the family. This has been true of almost every civilization, east, west, north, south, across time. Family is the basic unit. So when the core relationship in the family dissolves, marriage, the structure of society feels that stress and starts to tremble. What about on the parenting side? Because the modern doctrine of questioning all authority makes parenting hard today. It does. It's important we see this and just know that we're up against. Think about it. How can you shape the character of your children through appropriate discipline if that means exercising authority? And authority as such is evil. How's that even going to work? Is it, doesn't my child's authenticity override my authority? Parents are often scared of their kids nowadays or submissive to their kids or at their kids beck and call all the time. This is a major contributor to what we have called a child-centered home as opposed to a marriage-centered home. We gotta see this larger picture. By the way, in case you're wondering, I'm not up here just to like champion good old-fashioned authority from the good old days. Actually not. The Bible, in many ways, is sympathetic to the modern suspicion of authority. Think how often the Bible, if you've read it, throws up for us stories of wicked, wicked kings and corrupt priests of men abusing women and women abusing men and people in general using power in a way to do harm, not to do good. The Bible shares that suspicion. Jesus' own disciples one day in a dispute with some villagers, they ask his permission. They say, Lord, let us call down thunderbolts from heaven. We're going to blast them off the face of the earth because that's what we do with power. For a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Bam, 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 bam. And Jesus rebuked them that day and showed them a different way. Here's what Jesus both taught and modeled, and it's really throughout the whole scripture, is this. That authority must be baptized in authentic love. Let me say that again. Authority must be baptized in authentic love. Love. It's not a question of either authority or authenticity. That's a false choice. You actually can have both. In fact, you must have both. Authority is not evil. It's morally neutral. Authenticity is also not evil. And together, these two things purify one another. They illumine one another. And in every healthy whole family, both of these are active. There is love and there are firm limits. There is authentic joy in relationship, and there is authority. Both of those things work together from the Bible's viewpoint. But it's important we see the larger cultural picture. All right, let's talk about being kids. I loved being a kid. I still am a kid. I have always loved kids, too. I've just, uh, it's a fun stage of life. I want to show you some evidence that I was, in fact, once a younger kid than I am now. 
So go ahead and throw up the picture if you would, please. Picture number one, that's me on the top, not the bottom. They called me Flying Ryan the Roaring Lion. And uh, that's how I began this life. And uh, I, I at, at night, had this screeching cry and scream. They called me the Bobcat because it was just so irritating. So with the, with the roaring lion bit and the screeching bit, um, I became a preacher. Shock. And now, whenever I'm at the airport and I'm like going through customs and they're like, do you have anything to declare? I'm like, oh, I have a lot to declare. I'm a preacher. You don't even know. Okay, so it was inevitable that I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay, next. Uh, there's us going to the, um, I don't know, elementary prom. Um, <laughs> that's my sister, Caitlin, on the top. She's uh, now a doctor of public health and uh, has three little daughters and her husband. They go to our church, really wonderful people. That's my little brother, Logan, on the bottom, who today could probably beat up anybody in this church. He's uh, a captain in the National Guard, lives up in Montana with his wife and kids, just got back from a year in Kuwait uh, on active duty. And uh, by the way, notice my um, bow tie, please, and um, I believe it's called a cummerbund. I was a uh, very swaggy four, uh, six-year-old, maybe, let's say. All right, next picture, please, is the baseball phase of my life. I adored baseball. Just, I wanted to be the shortstop for the Seattle Mariners. Like, love the game. Baseball? All right, next picture, please. <laughs> this is Halloween. I think I was the Fonz that year. And, um, um, yeah, a moment in life. Next, go ahead and throw up the next one. Uh, here's the whole fam. Uh, my little sister came on the scene. She's, her name's Candace. Uh, she's graduating later this month from Yale. We're very proud of her, and she's going to get married later this year. Uh, amazing young woman, and um, please notice my frosted tips at that point in time. It was a cool thing, you know, to frost the tips. Okay, um, next. So this is the I'm a fly fish and cowboy phase of life, and I knew every country music song there was, and um, I was a hick, and I uh, still am at heart in some ways. Uh, last picture, because then I went off to college, and the mullet became the thing, and I thought, ah, business up front, party in the back. And that's, that's what I did. And um, so I've had a lot of phases, and my long-suffering parents have been there through all of them. God bless their hearts. And, um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to talk a lot about the parent side of the equation, but what about the child side of the equation? We are all in our capacity, in some capacity, children. You know, I'm 35 now, but I still relate to my parents as I'm their child, they're my parent. We all do in some sense. So does the Bible have anything to say to us in that regard? And in fact, it does. It, uh, it comes in the Ten Commandments. It's so important, it made the short list of like 10 things you gotta know. So this is, the, this is the Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 12. It says this, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And then the next chapter, the Bible circles back around to this theme, but now from the different direction. It doesn't say what you should do. It says what you should not do. So listen to what it says in Exodus 21, uh, verses 15 and 17. Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Now that's pretty intense. <laughs> the result of dishonoring your parents is apparently like, it's like bad. But the result of honoring your parents is long life in the land. You can't have a stronger contrast than that. Life and death. But the question is, what does it mean to honor your parents? Does that mean you like have to obey them in everything for the rest of your life? Is that what it means? Or do you ever graduate out of having to honor your parents? Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, the Hebrew word here for honor is the term kavod. And it, its basic meaning is the idea of heaviness or weight. For example, in Israel today, in modern Hebrew, the term for gravity is koach hakavod, which means the force of weight, okay? In contrast to this, the word in chapter 21 for cursing your parents is the, is the root word in Hebrew for, is kal. And kal means lightness, the opposite of heaviness, it's light. So this is the basic contrast the Bible um, in the original language is getting at, uh, that honor is about 
heaviness. Dishonor is about lightness somehow. To honor one's parents is to give their words and their preferences weight. They are weighty. Whereas to dishonor one's parents is to make light of their words and preferences. Does that make sense? Heaviness, lightness. But why is the Bible so concerned about this? That there's a certain gravitas towards our parents, that we give weight to to them and what they say. Why? Well, the Bible's overarching goal for us as creatures is that we would live in right relationship with reality. And the reality is that everything we are, we owe to our parents. We do. Who gave you life? Who nursed you as a baby? Who tended you when you were sick? Who taught you language and social skills? Who sent you to school and fed you dinner? Who gave you the knowledge and relational networks you would need to make your way in the world as an adult? Who still loved you when you screamed like a bobcat, then frosted your tips, then for God's sake did a mullet? In most instances, the answer to that question is, our parents did all that. If you're here today, someone was there for you when you were a kid. May have been a complex situation, but someone was there for you. So at the bottom line, the inner logic of this biblical command is this. Showing honor is based in gratitude. Showing honor is based in gratitude. Our parents deserve our honor because everything we are and have is ultimately from them. Now, uh, I know some of you have like a yeah, but right on the tip of your tongue. And it's something like, yeah, but Ryan, my parents abandoned me. I, I never knew my dad and he definitely never brought me dinner. You know, my mom was on drugs and all of her boyfriends beat me up. What you're saying really is, Ryan, my parents aren't worthy of honor because they're not worthy of my gratitude. I have nothing to thank them for. I really got a bad deal in the parent department of life. And if that's you, um, I just want to say I'm really sorry about that. Like, that's not a small thing. That is not a small, yeah, but. That's a very, very um, significant objection. Um, And you may be looking at me and saying, well, it's easy for you to say that, pal. You got lucky. You got good parents. And honestly, you're right. Like, I feel like I hit the lottery. I did nothing to deserve that. Um, If you're in that place, though, let me just mention, I think, a couple things that may be helpful for you in sorting out how this biblical teaching applies to your life, to your situation. Let's answer them under the heading of, what if my parents are dishonorable? (laughs) What then? The first thing to know is this, is that you are not defined by your parents. You're actually not defined by your parents. Yes, in an ideal world, we would all be able to honor because we're grateful to our parents, but even if they're not people who are honorable, it doesn't mean you are trapped or doomed in the life that they've made for you. You are not, in the end analysis, defined by your parents. Many of you know that my dad, Pastor John, grew up in a broken home. His parents divorced when he was young. He lived with his single mom for a long time. Then she remarried. It wasn't a great situation. He was um, basically raised by his big brother. And you know, at some point in his young adulthood, After he came to Jesus, he just basically said, you know what? I'm not going to replicate this in my life. I am not defined by this. I am not creating a family just like the one that I grew up in. And he made, he drew that line in the sand and said, I'm not defined by that. And it, and it, and it, he, he charted a different path. Was it perfect? No, but it was a lot better than what he came from. So just know that you're not defined by your parents. You can't choose your parents, but you can choose your mentors. And my dad chose some good mentors that helped him in a different direction. Number two is this. We need to know that honor does not always mean obey in the strictest sense. Yes, when you're a youngster living under your parents' roof, provided your parents aren't asking you to do anything illegal or immoral, yes, you need to obey them. Like when you're five, there's no nuance. Obey your parents. (laughs) When you're 11, you need to obey your parents. When you're 15, 16, 17, it's getting harder, you gotta still obey your parents, okay? Provided it's not illegal or immoral, but what happens over the span of our lives? We leave the house, we eventually relate to our parents on a different footing, what then? 
What then I would say is that honoring our parents doesn't at that point always mean blind obedience. Sometimes it means respectfully disagreeing. Sometimes it means respectfully setting some boundaries and sticking to them. There's a way to show honor to people without being dependent on them, being subservient to them. And especially if our parents stand for things that don't align with scripture, we got to find a way to make that balance between remaining respectful and honoring, but not being coerced into um, blind obedience. Number three, and this is really getting to the heart of the issue now. Number three is this, is that Jesus helps us honor those who are not honorable. He helps us with that. This, in fact, is the deep spiritual reality at the center of the gospel, that God gives us something that we don't really deserve. It's called grace. And he, in turn, empowers us to give others things that they don't really deserve. Does that make sense? This is not a natural thing. You know what's natural? Being bitter, being hurt and mad and staying mad is very natural. And you know what? God had every reason to be bitter and mad at us because we rebelled against him, but he doesn't stay there. He goes on the offensive. Listen to what it says in the book of Romans. It says this, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, while we were still irritating and rebellious and all this, God goes on the offensive and says, I'm going to give you what you don't deserve. And that power in our life is what enables us to honor people who are not themselves honorable. And we do it not for them ultimately, but ultimately for God. And this brings us to the fourth point, which is this, that really we all hit the parent lottery with God our Father. We all hit the lottery with God our Father. The truth is every human parent is at some point going to disappoint us, irk us, not be everything we want, but our heavenly father will never disappoint us. In fact, the main, as we talk in the next two weeks about parenting, our main thesis that we're going to develop is this, that the secret to being a good parent is simply treating our children like God the father treats us. God is our father. He parents us. It's not complex how to be a good parent. You just parent like God parents you. That's the idea that we're going to develop. It's easy to show him honor because we can be grateful to him, not just for our own little life, but for life itself, for existence itself. It all comes from him. So if our earthly dad let us down, and that's the case for many, our heavenly father will never let us down. That's, that's the deep truth. Okay, so now be before we get to being single and mingling for Jesus, which I know is why you're here. Uh, let's touch quickly on two last implications of honoring your father and your mother, okay? The first is this. Let me put it as a question. The question is this. Do we have an obligation to care for our elderly parents? Do we have an obligation there? You know, I know this is a, a touchy and complex topic, and often we just make the whole question go away by paying people to take care of it for us, paying people to take care of our parents. And obviously, this is a complex issue. Sometimes there are medical needs involved that we are in, we're, we're incapable of taking care of. But the deeper issue here remains, it is gratitude. Who cared for us in our helpless infancy? Who did that? Shouldn't we show gratitude by caring for them in their sunset years? By the way, the rest of the world takes this for granted that you do care for your elderly parents. It's us in the West with our idolatry of independence, our idolatry of our own autonomy that has caused us to punt on this. So something to think about, what does the honor look like when my parents are aging? Secondly, you may be a parent here with kids living at home wondering, how do I teach this in my house? How do I, how do I get my kids to honor their father and your mother? How do I do that? Actually, it's not that hard. I, I don't think it's that complex. You know how you do it? You insist on it. You insist on it. I'll say, I never had my cheeks pinched harder, and yes, my rear end warmed more than when I disrespected my parents as a kid. They didn't really care. You're, you're clapping because I got spanked. That's mean. <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> no, I'm just totally kidding. <laughs> my parents didn't really care if I liked them all the time. 
they insisted I respect them all the time. Yeah. And you know what that's resulted in? I like them today. That's how, it, that's how it works. So here's a good rule of thumb for parents trying to figure out how this works. Here's a good rule of thumb, I think, in the home. Be gracious with mistakes and firm with attitude. Be gracious with mistakes and firm with attitude. Your kid spills the milk. Okay, well, let's try not to do that again. Here's a sippy cup. It's okay. It's a mistake. But your teenager rolls her eyes and storms out of the room. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no. That's not okay. Unacceptable. That's an attitude issue. We got to take care of that. Because parents shape their children's character. And character is a matter of the attitudes and the habits of the heart. So in the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking much more about those two things. So, okay, now for the fun part. Let's all get out our, our phones, get out our dating apps, and together we're all going to swipe. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. Okay, do you, uh, never mind. Um, <laughs> um, let's talk about singleness. My dear old friend, singleness. I knew her well for a couple decades and uh, just got married last year. And uh, the main thing I want to say to those of you who are single the thing is, I want you to know that you are not second-class citizens. You're third-class. I'm just totally kidding. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you're still awake. Okay. 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 Um, the funny thing is, the really funny thing is, actually, it's like ironic and tragic, but is that in church settings, oftentimes singles are like quietly stigmatized. If you're like a single adult, it's like, that's kind of strange. Are you like a freak? Or like, oh, I'm sorry for you. I pity you. But... Why that is so weird is that our Lord himself, Jesus Christ, was a happily single man. So someone help me here, because if we're all trying to be like Jesus and Jesus himself wasn't married, when did it become required for us to be married? Like, I don't, did I miss something? I don't, I don't quite get that. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, in our country today, some 50% of adults are currently not married. Either they've never been married, they uh, divorced, they had a previous marriage, or they're widowed any number of situations, and people who are not married have different desires there. Some want to be married. Some are, are, don't want to be married. They're not seeking that. And both of those postures have warm biblical approval and affirmation. There's nothing subpar about the single life. It's, it's, it's very true. So for those of you who are single, though, or you know somebody, one important issue to sort out through prayer and discernment is whether you have a vocation of singleness or whether you are in a season of singleness. Those are very different things. A vocation of singleness or you're in a season of singleness. Some people are truly called, like gifted, in fact, by God for a life of fruitful, joyful singleness. It's a vocation. The Apostle Paul was a man such as this. You know, the guy who wrote like the Bible, as if we need any more proof that there's real goodness and richness in the single life. Paul, in some of his writings, is pretty frank that, like, just so you know, when you get married, there's going to be real restrictions on your life. He's blunt about it. You know, when I'm driving around with my father-in-law, we're in the parking lot somewhere, and he sees the handicapped parking spot. He points to his finger and says, well, I'm married. I can park there. <laughs> just kidding. I asked him if I could say, I asked my mother-in-law, too, and they both said, it's fine. It's funny. Come on, it's funny. <laughs> there are limitations on your life when you say, I do. And some people are called to a vocation of singleness. Others, however, are in a season of singleness and they wish it ended like yesterday, you know? But for whatever reason, in the mystery of God's timing, a marriage relationship has not materialized. And uh, if you're in that camp, which I was in for quite some time, I think there are two things to be aware of, two pitfalls for singles to avoid. They are these. One, an idolatry of marriage. Number two, a fear of marriage. These are opposite dangers, actually, and I've fallen into both of them before. So let's have a look. The first pitfall is an idolatry of marriage, which is often also, by extension, an idolatry of the family, an idolatry of children. The basic idea is this. If I'm going to have a personally fulfilled life, if I'm going to have a meaningful existence, I have to be married. Actually, no, you don't. That's, that's actually not true. You know, um, one of the unique 
aspects of the early Christian movement in the first century in the Roman Empire is that whereas other religious movements, other social groups really pushed getting married, it was a requirement, the early Christians were unique in, in saying, you know what, the single life is beautiful. The single life has real merit. Um, and this was, ab this was very abnormal because you know what was normal? Getting betrothed when you're three years old to another three-year-old and then getting married when you're a teenager. Like there's, that was normal. You're like your, your courtship or whatever is like share the binky with me. Like you're not, there's not, um, you know, people ask, what's the biblical view on dating? The answer is there is none. Why? Because they didn't date. Like we understand it. They're just a very different, they go straight to marriage via betrothal, but then you're already locked in. You didn't, didn't have any say anyways. But the early Christians following the example of Jesus said, Singleness is a dignified and beautiful way to live. So this is the first thing to avoid uh, if, if you're in a season of singleness. It's the tendency to put a ton of pressure on the quest to be married, thinking it's going to solve all your problems and it's the most important thing in life. It won't because it isn't. <laughs> the only relationship that will ultimately satisfy us and the Bible often describes it in the language of marriage, is our relationship with God. He has to be at the apex of our longings. Not the only thing we long for. There's a lot of legitimate things we can love and long for. But he's got to be at the apex. Because if something else sits at that top spot, you know what it's called? It's called an idol. Idols are bad. You know why? Because idols always let us down. They are false gods because they make false promises. And so God doesn't want us to be duped, doesn't want us to fall for the bait. Okay, so there's that, an idolatry of marriage. But on the other hand, the second pitfall for singles to avoid, which is the opposite of obsessing about marriage, is shrinking away from it out of fear. You're actually saying, I don't want to be married. Um, dating, yes, that sounds fun, that sounds sexy. But marriage and like irrevocable commitment, a ring, I'll pass on that one. And why do we find ourselves there? For a number of possible reasons. Maybe you had bad examples. Maybe your parents split and you're afraid, oh, if I get married, I'm going to split too and it, it just doesn't work. I don't want to be married. Or maybe you're just impossible to satisfy. You know, you've airbrushed in your, your mind an image of, of something so perfect, the perfect spouse, good looks, lots of money, very charming, and us mere mortals never measure up to what is in your mind. So you're scared of being tied down with anything less than perfect as you unrealistically define it because you're always waiting for somebody a little more glittery to come down the pike. You're impossible to satisfy. Or maybe, and this is also very common, maybe your real idol, this is very common in our society, your real idol is autonomy and independence. You're, you, you value, above all else, complete freedom of movement and are terrified of ever having to rearrange your life around someone else's needs, someone else's circumstance. You like to keep your options open, but that's really just code for saying, I want my life to always be about me. The common denominator under these different scenarios is fear. Well, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? And fear is a tricky thing. And we'd need multiple counseling sessions to work through just any one of those. How do I know? Years of counseling. <laughs> That's how I know. But here's the upshot. God's perfect love drives out all fear. He exposes the idols in our lives for what they are, which is cheap imitations of what we're really longing for. He removes the idols. He replaces it with himself, and he thereby turns fear into freedom. That's a very good thing. So if you're in a season of singleness, you want to be married, uh, here are a few simple guidelines for seeking marriage. How do you do that? A few things here. Number one, you need to reassess your filter. What do I mean by that? Well, many singles have their filter set all the way up to perfect and they make the mistake of screening out immediately a lot of people who might be really beautiful people who would make a great life partner. But your filter is so unrealistic, you're missing people right in front of you. 
So maybe reassess your filter to, 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 to be more realistic. Number two, and this is the opposite mistake. Number two, you cannot have emotional involvement with an unbeliever. Just don't allow yourself that. This, this is the opposite mistake. There's one mistake that sets the bar too high. There's another mistake that sets the bar too low. And if you haven't been married for a long time and you've been wanting to be married, it's very tempting to do this. Somebody very beautiful and charming and accomplished and put together comes along and there's like just one little teeny little problem, which is that they're not so into the Jesus thing. But that's not a big deal, is it? It's a big deal. It's actually like a deal breaker. Um, here's what you have to do in that situation. And I've had to do this myself many times. In order to protect your heart in the long run, you got to be brutal with your heart in the short run. You have to do that. You have to refuse to let an emotional attachment develop with somebody who's not a believer. Why? Why? That sounds cruel, Ryan. Why? Because if you are not in basic agreement about the deepest, deep things, if you do not share the same reality map, you are setting yourselves up for a lifetime of heartache. Like you are. And so you've got to have a little pain now to save yourself a lot of pain down the road. It's not fun, but it's protecting your heart. Number three is this. You need to be prudently proactive. Prudently proactive. One thing a lot of Christian singles tend to think is, look, God's got my back. So one bright day, my doorbell's going to ring, and there's going to be a halo behind the one, and we're going to live happily ever after. It's gonna be, I don't have to do anything. It's going to be awesome. Does God work that way? He can. Does he usually? No. He usually requires us to participate in the process. So we have to prudently be proactive. What can this look like? Lots of things. Put yourself in a target-rich environment. Join a small group, maybe. You know, that's a good setting. Or um, here's an idea. Get an online dating app or two. Yeah, avoid creeps, avoid scams, absolutely. But guess what? God can handle the internet. God's not like afraid of the internet. In fact, he can use it as a tool. Um, or how about this? Join a compassion ministry here at the church and partner alongside other people. That's how Sarah and I met, actually. Uh, it was during COVID, so she looked like a girl from Saudi Arabia. Like I couldn't even see her. I didn't even know if she was cute or not. But that's when we first met. Is that a compassion? We were just both actively serving and our friendship began. So you got to be prudently proactive, okay? So let's land the plane here. I think we're already almost at time. Let's just revisit where we began, which is with the big picture. We live in a world that today makes it challenging to have a good family. There's a lot of pressures. Just in terms of what we talked about today, to society doesn't say honor your mother and father. Society says rebel against them. That's what all the cool kids are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Society doesn't say find a godly spouse and save intimacy for, for marriage. Society says follow your heart and experiment with a lot of lovers. But you know what? God's wisdom is not threatened by our cultural fashions. It's just not threatened. The first century, the Roman Empire was a lot rowdier and crazier than the 21st century. We're going to be just fine. We're going to be just fine. We could take a deep breath. The church of God goes forward because we follow a God who's in a a family type relationship with us. The Bible calls it a covenant. He invites us to honor him as our father. Honor your father, honor your heavenly father. And we're his kids, his sons and daughters, whom he views as perfectly whole, whether we're single or married or in some other, you know, some other relationship status, we are his kids. His authority in our lives is illumined by his authentic love for us. And he shows us his care by, by giving a hand of guidance, loving authority. And here's, here's the inner mystery. When we decide to live under that authority of God, put on pause who I think I am and live under God's authority, that's when my real authenticity starts to come forward. And when that authenticity is birthed in me, in you, in us, what we often find is that God is equipping us to carry genuine authority in our families, life-giving authority for our world. These things go together, and it all is grounded in the fact 
that Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you're, as the song says, you're a good, good father. Help us to be good children to you, to our earthly families. Lord, help us through different seasons of life, whether we're married, whether we're single, whether we're widowed, whether we're separated, divorced, whether we're just trying to figure out that whole bar park of life. Lord, would you give us grace? Would you help us to be wise? For my friends who are single, Lord, I pray that in your way and time, you'd bring them a wonderful spouse. Would you do that, Lord? I pray, Lord, that you'd help us as a church family to call people to the real family, which is the family of God. That as we gather in this house week by week to study the scriptures, to sing our countercultural music, I pray that the family of God would flourish and grow, that many sons and daughters would come into the kingdom because therein lies true hope, true faith, true love. We pray these things in Jesus' name.